So we are live. So I just want to say hello to everybody there. I see people are joining. Welcome. So we'll be starting, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. We're gonna wait for more people to join. Welcome if you're coming in now. Week three of the E3 Summit. Let me see if I can click this and see who's on. Oh, well, I see Kelly is here checking on us to make sure that we're doing okay. So thank you, Kelly. <laughs> so yeah, we'll give it a couple minutes. You know, beginning of school, maybe people have having a crazy day. So we will wait a little bit. Still not 7.30 yet. Do you want to tell us where you're from in the chat box? Dominga is in the chat box and she'll answer you there. Yes. The great thing about this is that we have so many people joining us from all over the world. And one of my favorite things when I do backup for Eileen or for anyone is to see where everyone's signing in from. And so if you guys could let us know where you're joining us from in the chat box, I'd love to see. We have, uh, I am joining you from Missouri. I'm in, and I'm in South Florida. <laughs> Jamie, where are you? And I'm outside Washington, DC. Okay, great. Well, last night, I know in the session I was on last night, we had people, literally from all parts of the world. You were, you were in there, Dominga. So we had yes. Australia, we had people all over the US. We had, we, had the U we had someone from UK, from the UK. We had someone who said they were, they were joining us from India. It was, it was incredible. It was incredible. And at 7.30 at night here on the East Coast, I don't know what time it even is in India. <laughs> right. It's like my new, my new favorite website, you know, my new favorite thing I Google, what time is it in whatever country our attendees are in. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, welcome Marshall joining us from Columbia, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Oh, Marshall, that's Jamie's friend. It is. Yes, <laughs> we helped Marshall register today. So thanks for joining us to watch Jamie. And it's just 7.30, so we're gonna give it a couple minutes as I see more people are joining. Mm -hmm. You have a great presentation tonight. I was looking forward to hearing this. See, I got to pick, I assigned the moderator, so I got to pick what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> For the most I part. Don't, I don't mean this to scare her because she didn't join us in the chat, but I saw her join the attendees list. Hi, Heather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Heather Bergstrom just joined us. Hi, Heather. Heather is in Minnesota that we know, one of mm -hmm. our volunteer leaders. And uh, Maria, I think Maria is here. In, Maria, I think is here in Florida with me, if I remember correctly. Oh, fun! So yeah. So people are joining. We'll give it a couple more minutes to give people a chance. We have a great presentation for you tonight. Hope you're really enjoying the summit, getting a lot of information. Um, what's great tonight is more of a quality of life kind of talk, not not this uh, heavy medical information seen a lot of very intense pictures the last few days. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any of that tonight, right, Jamie? No intense pictures. Okay. No, awesome. no okay. active surgery video. Okay, good. Thank okay, you. Yes. <laughs> I'm a wimp. So every time I was like hiding my eyes. I get it. I know. So anyway, well, it's, it's a few minutes past 730 and there's plenty of people on who are here on time. So we will, we will get started here so that everybody else doesn't have to wait. So um, first I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Eileen Michelli, and I'm the Chief Program Officer for the Marketing Foundation. I also want to introduce my colleague, Dominga Ngo. Let's say hi, Dominga, so they can see you. Hi there. And she is in the chat box, and she'll be chatting with you there and posting links to relevant uh, uh, website, websites, to Jamie's website, and some other places that you might have relevant information to this talk. Um, we want to welcome you to the third week of the International E3 Summit, Educating, Empowering, and Enriching Our Community. 
brought to you by the Marfan Foundation and our divisions, the Vets Movement and the Lois Steed Syndrome Foundation, and our partners in Europe, Vessern. Um, we want. We also want to thank our. We want to thank. Sorry, we want to thank all of you for making this um, summit such a huge success. We have almost 2,800 registrants from 72 countries. Um, it's really, it's really been so gratifying to to see all of you involved, getting this information, and to hear from you and watch you connect with each other. Um, we hope that you've had a chance to meet other people in the app and that you continue these con connections after the summit's over. Um, as you surely know at this point, you're not alone on this journey. We'd also like to thank our presenting sponsors, Brigham and Women's Health and American Communications Construction uh, because of them. And we are able to give um, this summit to all of you um, at no cost, and that's really special. So we really appreciate their, um, their support. Um, I also would like to, um, to share with you, and this might not be as applicable for this presentation as for our medical presentations, but the International E3 Summit is a forum to provide an open discussion of issues related to genetic, aortic, and vascular conditions. Opinions stated in each of the talks are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Marfan Foundation or Vicern. If you hear differences of opinion from speakers and want further clarification, please contact our help center at marfan.org slash E3S. Um, as you can imagine, the volume is quite high right now during the summit, so please be patient. So, um, we have one more slide before we go to the presentation, and that is um, about your feedback. And so after this session, we'd love for you to give us your feedback. Um, right in the app, next to the Q&A box, you'll see the three stars that say rate. When you click on that box, you'll get a few other um, very basic questions. So hopefully you'll click on that afterwards and um, tell us what you think of the session. So tonight we have with us um, Jamie Barnhart. Um, we have a presentation from Jamie. Jamie, do you want to say hello first before we get started? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, that was very short, a little hello, but we're going to hear a lot more from Jamie later. <laughs> we're coming, though. We definitely will. So we're going to start with a presentation. The, um, the three of us are going to shut our cameras off, and we'll get into the, um, we will get into the presentation here. We will. Oops, sorry. Hi, welcome to our session today, Caring for the Caregiver. I am Jamie Barnhart. I am the co-founder and a current board director for Aortic Hope, um, a 501c3 charity organization focusing on um, patient advocacy and awareness for aortic diseases. So let's get started. Um, first, I want to tell you guys a little bit about myself um, and my story. I think it's really important that um, as caregivers, we share our stories, um, that we have a voice and, um, and come together to share that story. Um, and so a little bit about me. Um, I have three children, Grace, William, and Delaney. Um, Grace and her father, Bill, uh, both have Marfan syndrome. Um, we've known about Bill's Marfan syndrome since he was a child and Grace's as well. They were both about four years old when they were officially diagnosed. Um, over the last 17 years, we have experienced, um, see if I can remember it all, we have experienced two aortic dissections, um, uh, a couple hernia surgeries. We've experienced multiple mass infections um, that resulted in emergency open heart surgeries um, and various eye surgeries and, and minor things like that. Um, so I am, uh, I, I may be a professional caregiver um, at this point for um, when, when I look back at all of that, um, not only as the um, the, the spouse of someone who, it, who, who is affected, uh, but also a mother of someone who potentially will have similar issues as she grows older. Um, we, uh, we, my Grace's father and I, and um, a couple friends uh, founded Aortic Hope uh, in 2016 um, because we found that there was not an easily accessible place um, for either of us or any of us to go for support, to share our stories, 
and to um, to to ask questions um, about life and um, how to how to navigate through the crisis moment, the emergency time, um, and also the life um, that is created after um, the healing, the, the actual medical healing. Um, so you know you all have stories as well. Um, I encourage you to share them uh, with 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 your family, with your friends, um, and to reach out to, to the community. It does matter, um, and it's important that we share them with each other as we go through this. So today, um, we are gonna talk about a, a couple different things. I'm gonna go through some functional tips and tricks that I have learned along the way that have made the caregiving uh, journey each time um, a, a, little, a little easier. Um, a little more streamlined um, and, and quite frankly gave me a little more sense of control, which, which I know is a, a challenge and a struggle every day. Um, and we'll talk, well, we're going to touch on the mental health side of the, of the experience from a caregiver's standpoint um, and um, also talk about some resources that are out there. Um, so th this quote, with organization comes empowerment, um, I believe very strongly in that. Um, one of my my, my core beliefs is that as a caregiver, um, you know, your, your job um, has become information central and um, the ability to be able to step into the role of advocate um, on, on, a, on a quick, quick turn, sometimes a snap of a finger. Um, and so it is, it is extremely important that you have access to very clear uh, information that is as up-to-date, as accurate as possible without making 17 phone calls to nine different doctor's offices and waiting for faxes and emails to come in to the ER. Um, I would, I have it in uh, multiple places, you know, having it in two places, um, you know, either, you know, on your person or electronically accessible is, um, is, a, is a good way to do it so that you can share it quickly and easily. Um, the other, the other piece of empowerment advice is there are hard conversations to have after um, a, a crisis, um, the first crisis, so that you have the information going into the next. Um, you know, those hard conversations are things about DNRs, um, what, what treatments, you know, your, your, um, your affected family member or friend um, finds acceptable or not acceptable. Um, they are extremely difficult. They are extremely emotional and extremely, extremely important because when you are in a moment to make a decision, you want to know exactly what that person would want. You don't want to have a question. Um, so, you know, I, I communicate those decisions to other people so that you're not the only one with that knowledge. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. Um, schedule, schedule, schedule. It is your lifeline. Um, it, you, I, I found that, um, that having a very defined schedule, day-to-day -day schedule, um, really helped me feel more in control when the world feels completely out of control, especially during the crisis. So how do we get, uh, how do we get there? Um, Doctors diagnose, nurses heal, and caregivers make sense of it all. And that is the organization um, that, that comes. The doctors are, and nurses are doing extremely important and hard work uh, to keep us all well and, and, um, and healed. Um, caregivers, we leave the hospital with, with the patient and have to make sense of the new life. So how do we make sense of our new life? Well, it is the fall right now, and so it's time to go supply shopping. Um, and he, so here I, there's a, uh, there's a joke around in my family that, uh, you know, when I show up at the hospital, you know, it's here comes Jamie and her binder. Um, but that binder is uh, my lifeline, information central. So you're going to need a binder, dividers, and notepad, just like you did when you were going to school. Sometimes... Uh, keeping it simple and using the old simple ways of doing things is the best way. Um, my medical information central binder um, has, has the tabs is listed up here. In general information, I have a one page sheet. Um, and in that one page sheet has 
um, information about, about the patient. I have uh, one for my daughter and we have one for her father as well. You know, birthday, um, you know, full name, age, blood type, you know, very, very inf general information. Um, contact list and um, that contact list tab, you're going to list every doctor um, every emergency contact, it, it's your, it's your, it's your go-to phone book. Um, latest scan slash tests. Um, I always have at least the last two um, results from a CAT scan or an x-ray or blood work um, or anything. You know, when you go and you, when it's CAT scan day, they're going to send those results to the doctor, request that they mail you a copy as well. Three hole punch it, put it in your binder. Um, when you walk into an ER, if someone says, well, when was their last CAT scan? You don't have to wait for them to go look at it. You can pull it out of your binder and give them that report. Um, meds tracker, um, always important. What are they taking? How much are they taking? Um, when during the day do they take it? When was it prescribed? Um, when, when, when or if they get to stop taking that medication? When was, it, when was that stopped? Um, you can even use it when you're in the, um, in the throes of, of um, recovery at home in those initial couple weeks, months, and, and you're trying to track all of the pain medication, things like that on when it was taken, use the, use the tracker. Uh, blood pressure tracker, same thing. Um, they can go hand in hand. Uh, research, there's always new research. There's always a new story. There's always something you want to ask a doctor about or figure out if it applies um, to your situation. So I always had a tab in there that if I found interesting things that I wanted to remember to ask about, I would print it out and put it in the research um, divider. I'd also go and print things out from the Marfan Foundation page um, and from American Heart Association and things like that and put that in there so that I had some general knowledge. Um, legal docs, this is where um, um, you will you will file and keep copies of DNRs um, so that you have them. Um, multiple copies, multiple have an original, a couple two originals, and then copy them so that you can pass them out as needed. Um, other tabs that you may put in there um, sometimes during our um, our recovery journeys we needed to, to log activity and, and food. Um, oftentimes uh, he would come home and um, with all the blood loss from surgeries and things be slightly anemic. And so we'd want to track um, what kind of food he was eating so that we could make sure that the iron was going up, we were getting sufficient protein, things like that. Activity log, you know, after that, those dissection surgeries, we got to get up and moving around and um, getting our steps in to, to get our body working again. And so that was a good reminder um, that, that we needed to do this. Um, a notepad. You always need a notepad. Carry one with you all the time. It doesn't have to be um, the eight and a half by 11 spiral notebook. It can be one that fits nicely in your purse. Um, you know, it, it, it just jot down notes. Um, I remember the first couple appointments, I, I didn't bring a notebook. I thought, well, I can, I'll just remember. This is so important that I will just remember everything the doctor said. And that's just not true. You, um, you as the caregiver are tired and you are overwhelmed. And a lot of these words the doctors are saying are all new to you. And you're, ex you're mentally, emotionally, physically exhausted. You're not going to remember it all. So take the notebook with you, um, jot notes down, and um, and that it's it's your it's your brain there on a piece of paper. Very very important. Um, legal documents. I can't stress enough to um, consult with an attorney in your state to make sure that they are um, executed appropriately. Um, this goes back to those difficult conversations. Um, please, you know, DNRs are very important. You um, don't want to have to be making those decisions without guidance from the patient um, when you're in the ER um, or going into the operating room. You want those um, clear directions for, for the whole team. Um, last will and testament, again, you know, you, you don't want to have to have it, but if you do, it, it's very important that you have it. Um, as I said earlier, probably the most um, challenging conversations to have, um, and, and I maybe some of the most important, um, and I'll stress that by telling you all a story that um, 
I was pregnant with my second child um, and uh, eight months pregnant. So getting so close to the end there. And that day, um, um, my, my, my then husband had a um, internal bleeding situation and um, we couldn't find it. And he was going into the operating room with, for an exploratory emergency surgery that we did not know what that outcome would have been. Um, it was just as equal that he would not come out of the OR as he would come out of the OR. Um, knowing that we had a very clear DNR, knowing that I knew exactly what he would want and having his brother also as a, um, a backup decision maker um, and fully aware of what the DNR said really did calm me in that moment. It, um, it allowed me to say, I know what decision to make. Um, you know, that, that is a very emotional decision to make, but it was, it was clearly laid out for me. Um, and, and so I, I, I can't stress enough that while it's scary and emotional, it does help you in the moments that you may need that document. Um, in your information, information central binder, um, you want multiple copies of, of both of those legal documents. Um, when you go into get admitted to the hospital, you can hand the hospital a copy of that DNR document, but you don't want to give them your only one. And so having a couple copies of that um, on hand is very important. Um, schedule. Um, I'm a planner uh, professionally and, and by nature. So um, this was really important to me as well. But this, go get yourself a paper planner. Um, there are many, many options out there. It, it doesn't have to be fancy or make it fancy. Um, mine's color coded. I have stickers. Um, you know, I have an inspirational quote on the cover. It goes everywhere with me. Um, during a recovery from a major surgery, there is a calendar at the house that everybody can see. Everybody who lives in the house, everybody who comes to visit the house, anybody who says, how can I help you? And they come over they can see the calendar so that everyone is aware of what is going on on what day. Um, so this is your master plan and, um, and it will help you organize the weeks, the days, your, you write doctor's appointments on there. You can write goals on there. You know, this week the goal is to walk, you know, for 10 minutes without stopping four times a day. You know, it can, it, those are your goal notes, things like that. Um, but that way no one can ever say that they weren't sure what was gonna happen that day or they forgot to do something. Put it out, hang it on the wall, right next to your front door if you need to. Uh, but that will help you at least feel some control over the schedule and what needs to get done. Also a really good place when somebody does call and says, how can I help? And all you can think is, I have no idea, but I know I need help, but I don't even know what to ask for. You can look at your calendar and say, well, he needs to walk 10 minutes today. Can you come over and just walk with him? Or um, even, you know, I'm so, I need to go grocery shopping today, but there's three things on the calendar. Can you go grocery shopping for me? Um, it will help you be able to answer that question which is, I know, a difficult question to answer sometime. I need you to ask me how I'm doing. This is so hard. Um, after a crisis during the emergency, even during recovery, even a year, two, three, five years later, um, you know, a lot, there's a lot of, of talk right now about caregivers um, in the world. Um, and everyone wants to know how the patient's doing. How is he or she after surgery? How are they recovering? And oftentimes um, it feels like people forget that the caregiver is experiencing this as well uh, in different ways, um, not physically, but, but mentally and emotionally. Um, and so it, it's, it's okay to feel like no one's asking how you're doing. Um, I, I, I get that. I, I feel feel and felt that as well. Um, it's important to reach out and share how you're doing. Remind people to ask you how you're doing. Um, which leads me into taking care of you. Um, 
there, you know, I, there's, there's, a, there's a saying when you get on an airplane that you need to put on your own oxygen mask before you put on someone else's because you can't help anybody if you aren't well. Um, caregiver fatigue comes on fast and strong. Um, and I, I remember feeling like it was a tunnel that I, I almost could see the light, but never quite could see the light. Um, and, and that really does lead into to caregivers um, experiencing depression and anxiety, loss of control, um, you know, PTSD. We are experiencing um, the trauma alongside our loved one. Um, we may not have surgical scars to show for it, um, but our trauma is real. Um, and it is okay to feel it. It is okay um, to acknowledge it. And it is okay to ask for help. Um, caregiver guilt is, 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 is really hard. I think if I had to choose caregiver fatigue or guilt, I might choose the fatigue over the guilt. Um, I always felt and sometimes still feel um, an overwhelming sense of guilt for feeling so tired and feeling so worn out and for feeling um, like waking up in the morning and just saying, I, I don't know if I can, if I can do this today. Um, because you look at your, at your, at your loved one who is physically hurting um, and had this mass trauma occur to them on a physical level and that didn't happen to you. Uh, but your life changed in that moment as well. And, um, and it's hard to get over that, that guilt that you shouldn't be feeling that way because, because you should be and you, and you can and, um, and it's valid. Um, you know, I, I encourage you to talk to people and, and share with your loved one that you're feeling that way. Um, you know, and, and keeping those communications open so that, that you can find some peace and rest for yourself. Um, I have this quote saved on my phone. Um, I have this quote. I must have posted this quote to Facebook 27 times in the last maybe year. Um, I have it printed and hung on my uh, bulletin board at my office. Um, you are allowed to, 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 to scream and cry. And, you know, if you need to throw a hissy fit one day, you're allowed to do that. What we aren't allowed to do is give up. And, um, and, and that emotional release is important. Um, we have a, a semi rule um, in, in my house that when these overwhelming, upsetting times happen and we feel the need to scream and cry, then I, you know, I allow myself, and it's an arbitrary number, you can make up your own number. I typically, depending on what it is, let's say uh, um, you know, uh, another dissection, I'm going to give myself, you know, three days to feel really sorry that this is happening, that that we're on this journey again, and and to to be upset and scream and cry. Um, and at the end of that time, I'm going to take the deep breath, and I'm going to get those ducks in a row, and I'm going to do what has to get done. Um, it allows me to mourn, it allows me to feel, and then it forces me to draw a line in the sand and move forward um, to, to make things happen so that we can get to the other side. Um, you know, in talking, you know, in my role with Aortic Hope, um, um, you know, we have a, a caregivers private forum um, group that uh, caregivers, we all talk to each other. And one of, one of the things that I hear from other people, um, and I know myself, is that after the recovery and your loved one can go back to work or if they can't go back to work, they get back to some kind of, of, of normal state. You know, some things are the same, you know, I mean, you, you know, you live in your house, you, you know, kids have school schedules. There's, you know, Taekwondo class and, and church events and um, family, you know, birthday parties and, and some things are the same yet. They're totally different. Um, you know, during, during the crisis, um, life is totally focused on getting through it and, and recovery and medical 
charts and tests and tracking pain medication and, and your life gets taken over by that. And eventually that, that winds down and you, you look back and you expect things to be the way they were before that crisis. Um, and they're not. Um, things are different. Things have changed emotionally and things have changed physically um, for both the, the, your loved one, the patient, and for the caregiver. Um, the term new normal, which we hear a lot right now in, in our current environment in the world, um, you know, and, and, you know, myself as a caregiver, I always thought, well, the new normal after this episode, the new normal after this episode, new normal is my least favorite term in the whole wide world right now. There is no new normal. Um, whatever that way of being was, it isn't anymore. Um, and there's going to be a new way of being. Um, one might not be better or worse than the other overall. They're just going to be different. Um, some things that we all look back and took for granted, um, you know, may not be there. They may be harder, but some other things might be better. Um, and, and so going in, you know, accepting and adapting, accepting that things aren't going to be the same, um, mourning those things and then adapting and, and creating new ways of being um, that work for, for the, new, the new way that life is. Um, now, some ways that life changes. And I think um, this was one of the hardest parts for me. During a crisis or during an emergency, it was very clear what I needed to do. Um, I needed to track medications. I needed to um, understand the, the CAT scan measurements of an aneurysm. I needed to understand the difference between a stent um, and a Dacron sleeve. You know, I needed to understand what good blood pressure was, what, what, what bad blood pressure was, and, and what a fever could mean and what maybe wasn't, wasn't so emergency um, in that situation. That, that was easy. That, it's very clear cut what you need to know in the emergency. It's, it's when you get home and when, when life is a little bit, um, you know, normalizing or, or equalizing. Um, so many appointments. There are so many appointments and there are so many different doctors. You have your surgeon for a while, then you've got your cardiologist who you're seeing more often. And then you might have your mental health professionals and there's just so many appointments. I always felt like there was always every week or every three or four days, there was some, some other doctor we were going to. Um, and so, you know, you, you just go back to your paper planner to your schedule, you schedule them. Um, we would try to make them fun. Um, we, you know, we live in uh, Northern Virginia and are lucky enough to be seen by the uh, Marfan team at John Hopkins. Well, it's, it's an hour away. It's not too bad. So we would, we would purposely make appointments um, all on the same day. So we would just have one whole day running around John Hopkins. Um, and we might even make one for early in the morning um, and go up the night before um, and stay in a hotel and kind of make it an, a little bit of an adventure so we could get some fun in between these appointments. Um, I'll tell you even now, my favorite, um, my favorite thing to do with, with, surgeons and cardiologists is to go and spend, you know, an hour in the waiting room and 45 minutes with the doctor and come out of there with, well, no changes, status quo. Um, that's the most relieving report I, we, we hear. Um, you know, I, I don't want to go in and hear changes. I want to hear status quo. Um, but there are a lot of appointments. Household roles change um, because, you know, whether, whether, whether your patient is mom or dad or son or daughter, um, you know, the, the things that they were actively doing in, in the home, in the household, move to somebody else during the crisis. And you get into a routine and sometimes forget to pass back some of those roles that they can, they can take on again. Sometimes they can't take on those roles again. Um, and you have to adjust. Um, you know, in, um, during, a cri during a crisis and, and trauma, you know, whoever is, is the primary caregiver pretty much becomes the CEO of that household. Um, also the operations director and the chef 
and the taxi driver um, and everything. And uh, we need to remember that um, when things are equalizing to, to pass back some of those roles. And if you can't pass back some of those roles, maybe delegate them out um, to other places. Um, finances, you know, I mean, money, who likes to talk about money anyway, but you know, that, that, that changes too. Um, you know, caregivers, we, we sometimes have to take leave from our jobs in order to be home to care. Um, the, the patient, if, if they were working is, is home, you know, either on, on sick leave or disability and sometimes unpaid. And so, um, you know, the, the, the finances get, get out of whack. Um, and then you have all these, these bills from the doctors. Um, and if you're blessed to, to have really great insurance, um, maybe those bills aren't so scary. But, um, you know, I remember several times getting some scary bills and having some um, tough conversations with the insurance companies. Um, there's one insurance company that kept sending us a bill um, that they were going to pay for um, the surgical assistance, but not the surgeon because of a pre-existing condition. And um, the girl on the phone could not understand why that was ridiculous because you can't be an assistant without the surgeon. So why would you pay for the assistant, but not the surgeon for the same exact surgery? Um, so it, we didn't end up having to pay that bill, of course, but um, you know, those things do get out of whack um, and, and you need some, some attention after life. Um, gets equalizes again. Um, int intimacy and relationships. Um, you know, this is one of those conversations that um, I think caregivers, we think about in our heads. Um, I don't know that we have open conversations about it. There have definitely been conversations, um, you know, in, in support groups and things like that, but, but this is maybe one of the hardest one. You know, it changes um, your relationship when when you go um, into a caregiver slash patient role. Um, you know, you are still a husband or a wife or a mother and father, um, but you are also their lifeline. You are also helping care for them in in a in a very healing way. And in some ways, it can increase that bond between you. Um, and in other ways, it. Um, it can cause a barrier um, and both, you know, an emotional intimacy, physical intimacy, um, you know, in all ways. And so um, it does change. It takes a lot of effort. Um, and I think, um, you know, really being open with, with your patient loved one um, is, is really important um, to make sure that you, your relationship um, is evolving along with the recovery. Um, vacation planning, which sounds kind of like a small little detail here, um, you know, after we're talking about intimacy and relationships and finances and household management, but, um, you know, it's, it's summer vacation time, right? We're going to go to the beach, you're recovered, you know, let's, let's go um, have a nice relaxing time where we can kind of get away from some stuff, but you can never get away from being post-dissection or post-traumatic um, surgery or, or a medical situation that that will go with you on your beach vacation. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, we always kind of know where the closest hospital is. Um, and that binder, that information central binder, um, that gets packed in the car with us too. Um, although one way you can uh, um, eliminate that from the packing list is saving all those things on, say, a USB drive and putting that in your car. So save some space for, you know, your surfboard or, or things like that. Um, but but the, even things like vacation planning change because you're so aware of the need for emergent care um, on, a, on a drop of a dime. Um, you know, so I think the, you know, we don't, we talk about the initial recovery, but we don't often talk about the way things have changed long after that. And so, um, you know, these, I'd say these are the top, these are the five things that, um, that I found to be the biggest changes in our life. Um, you know, after, and, and they change every time a trauma occurs. Um, and so you going, accept and adapt, you accept and adapt and accept and adapt and um, continue that cycle each time. 
Um, I want to leave you all with some with some resources. Um, of course, Aortic Hope, um, as I said, we are a um, a network of of um, people affected by aortic disease. Um, whether you've had a dissection, um, currently have an aneurysm, or are or at risk for aortic disease, um, we have you know we talk about we have we also have a whole caregiving side um, and talk and and have a caregiving support forum. Um, we do live Q and A's on Facebook with with doctors, um, so you can ask questions um, and hold some online support groups. Um, through Facebook as well. So, um, you know, please join us there. Of course, the Markham Foundation is um, always amazing. Um, Caregiving Action Network, uh, rarecaregivers.org is um, a national organization that um, has a lot of great resources about caregiving. Um, national Alliance on Mental Health, um, also a good resource. And Think Aorta US is a new project um, with Aortic Hope, um, John Ritter Foundation, Thoracic um, Society of Surgeons. So that is um, an awareness campaign to get the Aorta, Think Aorta uh, message to ER so that people, when you walk into that ER, are, um, are thinking about your aorta as well as your heart and well as about stroke issues. Um, so those are some resources for you. Um, you know, what I'd like to leave you with today um, is that you are not alone. You are feeling the trauma alongside your loved one. And um, it is okay to feel overwhelmed and lost. Um, but you are not alone and there are people out here. We, um, it is really important that we all, we all talk to each other and help each other through this um, organization so that you're ready for the next time. Um, preparation is key and, um, and making sure that you're taking care of yourself. So with that, um, thank you for joining me today and I'm looking forward to answering all of your questions and hearing all of your stories. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, that was, that, you know, that was, that was all the stuff that has to be said. You know, mm -hmm. people are thinking that, but it just has to be said. And one thing I thought of while I was listening to you um, and some of your advice was a poem that um, our former board chair actually shared with, with us at an event. It's called Welcome to Holland. Are you familiar with that poem? I'm not. Um, so Dominga posted the link in um, the chat and it's really about how how when you're having a child, you know, you're, you're, it's like you're going to Italy. You buy all the guidebooks, you buy all the clothes you need, and you're with your friends, and you're all talking about going to Italy, but your child's born, and I'm getting goosebumps as I tell you, talk about this, but, and you're not going to Italy because your child has this condition, but you're going to Holland, and you're disappointed you're not going to Italy, but Holland is also beautiful, and there are other things that you discovered about Holland, the tulips, the windmills, and um, the poem is just, it, it gives me goosebumps every time, and so Domingo um, put that in, um, in the chat box, women, you were talking about a new normal and what's, you know, Oh, it's my least favorite term. Not ever. normal, but it's something different. Mm -hmm. And so I thought this, I thought that poem might add something and help people. Anyway, there were several questions in the, um, in the Q and A. So let's go right to them. Cause we want to talk okay. about not my poem, but about the people who are participating <laughs> here. And, um, people did share some personal information, but I think it's important to, to pose that as part of the question. So the first one is from a mom of two boys with beds and autism mm -hmm. and a fiance with beds. She's constantly wearing what seems like 10 million different hats. Mom, maid, nurse, therapist, educator, cook, OT. Taxi driver. Yeah, exactly. Mediator. Um, yeah, how can I, how, and, and you can accept that you have to do all those things, but she says, how can I or anyone really not feel guilty taking time for yourself when there's so much to do and so little time to, to do it in? Mm, amen. Um, yeah, we all feel that. Um, you know, I could tell you that just don't feel guilty, but that that's not really how it goes, right? We all know logically that feeling guilty, um, that, that we deserve our own time. Um, you know, my, my, my piece of advice from, from my experience, um, it's really hard. And as a caregiver, it is very difficult to look at your loved ones who um, ha who are affected, and tell them 
that you need time for yourself, that you're tired of your caregiver role, right? Because you, you just, you feel like you're letting them down, you're disappointing them. Um, and that's where the guilt comes in. And so, you know, my, my experience is, is you've got to, you've got to find the friend, the other family member, um, you know, there's so many support groups and there's such a big community out there right now that, you know, find somebody that you can talk to about the guilt. So the more you talk about that feeling, it's a little freeing, um, you know, and, and it is important to take care of yourself, um, you know, and, and taking me time. I, I have a note here because um, I saw some of the questions ahead of time that taking me time and saying, I just want to go to the grocery store by myself. Okay, that is not me time. That is still a function of taking care of or doing a to-do list item. Me time is I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to turn on bad 90s pop rock and I'm going to drive for an hour and I'm going to turn my phone off. That's me time. Um, but and So you've got to take that time. It really is important. Um, and the first couple of times you do it, you were going to continue to feel guilty, but it's important. And so I would say, you know, reach out. Um, you're wearing a lot of hats, um, but reach out and, and find there, there. We do get it. There are, we are out here. There are caregivers out here who want to share our stories and help and share our advice and um, do so it. Jamie, from, from your family member's point of view, I mean, just to follow up on that question, you know, if you talk to your family members who you've been taking care of, have they told you, you know, Jamie, mom, you should do this for yourself. You always do things for me. Do they, do you get that kind of feedback? I do. Um, do, you ask I, that kind of, do you ask for that feedback or you get that feedback? Um, you know, it took a really long time to ask for it, to ask for that me time. Um, I'm definitely better now than I was 10 years ago or even five years ago at it. Um, how did I get there? Um, you know, we talked a little bit during the mental health slide about, about therapies and PTSD and things like that. Um, you know, my own therapy helped me find that, that voice and the words to use. Um, you know, but also my, my two family members who are affected are, are very, very involved in Marfan Foundation. We all are. And um, I think that's been an interesting perspective for them because they see and hear some of the caregiver things. Um, sometimes hearing it from not your own family member. You know, my, my daughter, um, those of you who are involved in Marfan Foundation, my, my teenager is on the team council and is very involved. And she will come to me and tell me things like, mom, I get it, da, 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 because she hears it from somebody else, right? Because your own family member, there's an emotional tie. But if, if she hears it, say, from you, Eileen, all of a sudden it has, you know, 10 times the weight. Right, right. So whenever she texts me, I always, I always respond to her right away. It's got to be something. Right? <laughs> There's always something going on. There's always something for the teenager. Um, and now let me get just another question in the in the um, in the app. My boyfriend and younger son have confirmed beds, and my older son has ADHD. It just fell on her plate. Mm -hmm. um, I am a stay-at-home mom, so most of my the da most of the daily going ons are my responsibility. Again, same thing as the other person. Mm -hmm. um, I have very bad arthritis in both of both my wrists, but I don't get a break. How do I manage my own family's? my family's health and happiness without jeopardizing my own. Again, again, it's about taking care of yourself. It is. So for this one, um, you know what? Outsource. So one of the, you know, I like to find silver linings. Um, and one of the silver linings of this whole pandemic situation that we're in now is that all of these companies have developed these delivery and curbside options, right? So you know, five years ago during, during recovery, I, you know, I'd have to go to the grocery store and get a babysitter for the kids and go to the grocery store. You don't have to do that anymore. You can outsource some of these things. So find the things that are simply outsourced and take them off your plate, put them on somebody else's, you know, um, Instacart can bring you your groceries and, and then you, you're not going to the grocery store. You don't have to worry about that hour and a half of time. Um, you know, and also that calendar, that planner, I mean, my planner sitting right next to me right now, um, I still live by a paper planner, um, but schedule it and schedule all your, all the doctor's appointments and schedule, pick a day. Maybe it's even, you know, the third Friday of every month and there's nothing that you're going to schedule on that day. So you can get a, you know, there's a breather coming. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it I still goes back to what you said, put on your own oxygen mask so you can take mm -hmm. care of other people. Like you can't help them if you're not your best. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I struggled, Eileen, you know me really well, a little bit of a control thing, um, you know, when it comes to the, the recovery. But, um, 
One of the things that I learned uh, over time, over many surgeries, is that that our loved ones, our affected ones, can do these things. And it might not be the whole thing, but they can do these things. So find the things they can do right. and put those on their list. And, and they will feel like they are contributing to the, to the management or to the recovery. Um, you know, um, you know, my, my kid's dad was, you know, post emergency surgery and I had a newborn baby and, he, you know, I, in the middle of crisis and, um, and you know what? The only thing he could do was hold a baby in a bottle. And so, you know what he did for three months? He held a baby in a bottle. Yeah. And that's all he could do, but he could do something. And it helped him feel involved. It helped him recover. Um, and so, you know, again, outsource. Either outsource to your family members, the little things, but get all, get out, get the unnecessary stuff off your plate. That, that's really great advice. Really great advice. Um, the next question, also somebody who really feels like her health is deteriorated. Um, but, she, you know, she goes a little further and says that she's concentrating so much on her son and his needs that sometimes she feels like she doesn't exist. And so she takes care of her son to the best of her ability, but she feels like she's forgotten. So how can she look after herself when she doesn't, but she doesn't feel like anybody understands her, or at least she feels like they don't understand her? Yeah, What's no, that? I, get, I get that. I, I've been there, um, been there many times. Um, and, and, you know, I, I say, you know, reaching out is the hardest step, um, I, I think, um, but reach out, you know, encourage you, you know, you know, with particularly with like aortic hope, you know, we have a caregiver support page. It's private, nothing gets shared outside that page. And there's caregivers there who are either in the throes of something or have been there a long time, you know, reach out and, um, and talk to other people and share your story and, and, and take, you know, find some advice. And, and again, um, taking care of yourself, you have to schedule it. Yeah. You just have to schedule it. You know, um, you know, I, before the webinar started, Eileen, you and I were talking and, um, you know, I ha I still have my therapy appointment. It's on my calendar at work and it's a, don't move it, don't touch it. The mm -hmm. building might be on fire, but you're going to have to wait an hour. Um, and you have to schedule your, your self care, um, so that everybody knows that it's happening. It's important. Um, and that they, for that hour, if it's only an hour that they, they need to give you that, that space. And there's other, there's another point I wanted to make with this because, you know, when you're not the one who has all the health issues and the people around you or another family member has them, you know, you feel like nothing, I can, what do I have to complain about if something's not going right? And we had, I'll never forget mm -hmm. this again, another, another former board member who had, you know, she had a really rough, uh, journey with marfan syndrome a lot of surgeries a lot of some emergency right. surgeries like bill and um you know she said to me one time just because i have a dacron aorta doesn't mean that you can't have a bad hair day you know right. so she had some perspective like yes like my plot is not great and i've had some bad luck and have this condition but that doesn't mean that your things are also not important exactly so it's not a competition conversations you know yeah. We're not in a competition for who, you know, whose who's, uh, day is worse and who feels worse. And um, it took me a long time to understand that, um, actually. And, um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, it, it, you've got to go outside your, your, you know, your patient, your, your, your loved one, your affected one to, to have an open conversation. You know, I mean, you need to have that communication along with them, but you need somebody who you can go to who maybe can give you an outside perspective. You that know? was what I was looking for too. Perspe you need perspective because mm -hmm. you, 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 you have to give yourself permission to take care of yourself, to be able to complain about something, even though if it's not as bad, like you said, it's not a competition, but right. you, know, you still have your things and you're a person too. And yeah, um, your person in the family and all that. So absolutely. Um, okay. This, here's another question. Um, and this, I, I'm curious how you handle this, Jamie. Mm -hmm. um, what are the ways a caregiver can handle her job and, and her employers and colleagues' expectations, you know, in terms of performing what you're supposed to be doing during the day. But then again, you may need to attend to the care of your loved one at the drop of a dime. And no matter how big of a job you have or how, you know, whatever your job is, it's important. But whatever level you are, you're That's still so your family member. How do you, how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, so, so I've dealt with this both as, um, as kind of the low man on the staff totem pole um, you know, and now, now as, as the, the boss in the office. And, um, and so the biggest takeaway is, um, communicate, 
is, is let, your, let your team, whether they're your coworkers, your supervisor, your boss, let them know. You don't have to share the gory details if you're not comfortable doing so, but um, let them know, you know, if, if, you know if, it's a, if it's a dissection and there's a surgery, hey, I'm gonna need, you know, this much time off and over, go ahead and overestimate that because if the doctors tell you it's gonna be a week, it's really gonna be three. Um, you know, or, hey, you know, my, my spouse has Marfan syndrome and has a history of these things. And sometimes I might need to just go. And so communication is key. Um, I think that a, another silver lining with this whole pandemic and this whole working from home thing is that people are a little more open to that now. So if it's a rough time and your, your, your loved ones need more help at home, um, you know, you can be there and still connected if you have a job that, that allows that. Um, but it really comes down to communication, making them part of the team um, and telling them when you need total time off or telling them when you just need flexibility. Right, I think that communication is key and the flexibility now employers, um, I think back to when I worked in New York City and there wasn't very much flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's so different because everybody's, you know, so many people are working from home. I don't wanna say everybody, but so many people are working from home and employers, See that productivity is not um, is is not waning just because people are doing it on their own time. So even even if it's not an emergency, like doctor's appointments or just somebody needs you to sit with them and you know for half hour while they you know while whatever you know, um, there's definitely more understanding and flexibility. But I think talking about it and letting people know what again setting the right expectations and don't worry, I will get it done but it may need X, Y, and Z, so. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you know, letting them know up front because the surprise is the hard part. Right. Do you think it's harder for caregivers now because so many people are not going out and you're kind of stuck at home? Like, what's your feeling on that? I do, um, you know, because, you know, part of, part of the, the me time is getting out of the physical environment in which you are caregiving, you know, especially during the, those crisis times and recovery times. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not, I mean, you can't go anywhere, right? right? I mean, there's no, where are you going to go? <laughs> you can't go meet a friend at a restaurant, right? You know, there's three tables at every restaurant that are outside and they're all full all the time because there's only three tables left. So um, I do think it's harder. Um, and, and, but, but I also think, you know, like I, like I said earlier, get in your car and drive around for a while, you know, go sit at the playground. I've done this in my neighborhood, go sit at the playground in your neighborhood with your phone and um, Zoom a friend or FaceTime a friend, you know, you're just get away. Some simple things sometimes uh, are okay. And it doesn't have to be long. Even 20 minutes is helpful. I, I like to go walk and yeah. I can think and listen to my music and I have not left my neighborhood. But I know I used to be much better about this whole, like, you know, exercising during stress. And I would, I would put on, um, you know, some really bad nineties music and put on my earbuds and run. It's and also a good time to catch up. It's also a good time to catch up with friends. You know, time just goes. Mm -hmm. We kill many birds with one stone, and you really do feel refreshed after something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I'm going to go back to our um, our close here because we've definitely um, definitely gotten a lot out of this here, Jamie. I really appreciate all of what you've of presented and the conversation. I think that, like I said before, it just has to be said. You know, mm -hmm. I think some of these sometimes you read it here and there, but to hear a person who's gone through it and to actually have you talk about it and, and some steps. I think you gave a lot of really concrete advice for people and they definitely have at least two, three, four things they can take away from this session and actually implement tomorrow. Yeah, so. absolutely. And you know, if anyone on here wants to talk more, I'm always happy to talk about it. Um, you know, Aorta Cope's caregiver page, everything's on Facebook. And so, you know, you can reach out to, to any of us there and one of us will answer and, um, you know, there's a network out there to talk to. So please reach out. Yeah, you are just not, you're just not alone. So if you have more questions um, related to resources or anything, again, Jamie's share her information or you can ask our health center at markand.org slash E3 ask. Um, like I said before, the, the, the volume is high now. So please be patient. Um, we do, we do appreciate it if you complete the survey um, in the app so we can get your feedback on this. So we know what else we can offer you, what else you might need, what you liked. Um, we also ask that you visit the exhibitors in our virtual exhibit hall in the app, you know, watch their videos, they're real short. Again, these are um, hospitals and institutions that have supported this event and made it possible for us to offer it for free to all of you. So we um, please do that. Um, 
again, keep connecting with community. I think that was definitely a key message from this session. Um, you can do it in the app and do it on Facebook and, and many other virtual support groups like we offer. Um, and what um, Jamie has talked about, the way you are to cope. Um, if you're able to share what you've learned on Facebook and talk about what a great session this was, I mean, use our hashtag E3Summit20, tag the Markdown Foundation, tag A Order Hope. I'm sure Jamie would have, and her colleagues would appreciate that. Um, and if you would like to support more programming like this, your donations are always welcome at marketing.org slash donate. And um, before we end, we just want to put in a plug, and I definitely want to talk to you more about this for Aortic Hope and thanks to Aorta. Um, big week coming up, Aortic Disease mm -hmm. Awareness Week. Um, it's the week of the 19th to 26th. And the Markdown Foundation is raising, asking people to raise their hands to raise awareness for the risk factors of aortic disease. And so um, hopefully Dominga can uh, put the link in the chat box. Otherwise you'll see it in the app, you'll see it on our social media. Um, yeah. And we're gonna create videos. We'll be running all week during aortic disease awareness week. It's a lot of fun. We get, we get entries from all over the world and it's great to see the people with different conditions different countries. And yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing, just because we all have caregivers here, um, is I'm going to be doing a support group um, on the 22nd uh, in conjunction with the John Ritter Foundation for that week. So, um, you know, look at John Ritter page or Aortic Hope page and, and we're going to do caregivers only support. There's also an Aortic Disease Awareness Week Facebook page mm -hmm. and, and all of these will be on that page. So I know I got more information from them today. So we'll be yeah. doing that as well. And so thank you all for joining us tonight and spending an hour with us learning from Jamie um, Barnhart from um, Aortic Hope. And um, thank you so much, Jamie. Any final words? Thank you, Eileen. No, um, you know, just I encourage you all to connect and reach out and uh, remember to take care of you. Exactly. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you.